Okay, are we are we all ready? Okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, I shall <laughs> I shall do. All right. Welcome to the final day of the summer school. Um, just to remind you a bit about my background, I'm Nick Achilleos, uh, lecturer at the Department of Physics and Astronomy at University College in London. Um, part of the astrophysics group who do research there. Uh, I've previously been a support scientist for the magnetometer instrument on Cassini, which was how I think I got my real uh, first serious introduction to, to space plasma physics and space science. Um, I've also had uh, experience modeling the thermospheres and the magnetospheres of the giant planets, um, a bit about which I'll talk today. Um, I'm currently part of the Cassini magnetometer team and also a co-investigator on the planned magnetometer instruments on the JUICE mission to Jupiter, which is the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer. Okay, and you've heard that mission mentioned this week. Okay, so here's my opening slide, um, which kind of gives us an idea about the kind of themes that I want to address now. And I'm going to touch um, on a lot of topics um, and physical concepts that you will have heard about this week in other lectures. So the nice thing about going last is that a lot of what I'll say will be familiar to you. So that's, that's nice. Okay. So what we're going to do is go back to basics. And we're going to sort of take a lightning tour that tells us about how we start off thinking about plasmas in terms of the individual motion of charged particles in electric and magnetic fields. And then how, instead of you know, going to all the trouble of monitoring every single particle in a plasma, we can use the um, MHD, Magnetohydrodynamic Framework, that a lot of you know about, to talk about average properties of the plasma. So the average velocity pressure, temperature, which tells us, um, in a sense, about the spread of velocities and energies um, in our particle distribution. We'll then look at the dominant type of plasma flows in different planetary magnetospheres and what determines what type of flow that will be. Essentially, that's a, comp that's a competition between the, um, the strength with which a planet can impose its rotation on its magnetosphere and that's competing against the solar wind related flows that are driven by reconnection, which is a process, again, that you've heard a lot about this week. Okay, and then we'll end off by considering the process of magnetosphere ionosphere coupling at different planets and how that works. Um, and we'll see that at Jupiter in particular, that process has a lot to do with planetary rotation and is internally driven. Um, and we'll also look at the signature, the observational signature of magnetosphere-ionosphere coupling, which is, of course, the aurora at different planets and the auroral emission and the different morphologies that the aurora can take. Okay, so let's begin with an overview of the kind of systems that we're interested in. You guys have seen this kind of diagram many times this week. So it's a cartoon of the Earth's magnetosphere showing you the famous uh, field structures that mark mentioned in his lecture, the cavities, the tubes, and the sheets. So the entire magnetosphere as a whole can be thought of as a cavity that's carved out in the flow of the solar wind. Uh, we also have flux tubes, which close to the planet take this nice classical dipole form, as though one had buried a very strong bar magnet somewhere in the interior of the planet. And further from the planet, particularly in the magneto tail, the field lines get stretched out into these long radial configurations. And we know from what we've heard in previous lectures that wherever you see um, a sharp change in field direction across a relatively small spatial scale in space, that change has to be supported by a sheet of current because it's a curl-free field. And Ampere's law tells you that whenever the curl of V is non-zero, you need current density J to support that field structure. So to give you some idea of the properties of, some <coughs> of a couple of the different plasma regimes in this picture, we can compare the plasma sheet population, which is a hot population, particles typically KeV energies, relatively low densities, a few tenths per cubic centimeter, with the plasma sphere, which is quite a different beast. It's um, cold plasma, about one EV or, or of that order. 
and relatively high density, something like of the order of a thousand particles per cubic centimeter. And flows are very different too. Flow in the plasma sphere being in the sense of planetary co-rotation and in the tail um, being very much driven by the interaction with the solar wind and the associated reconnection. Okay. Here's a close-up of some of those regions that have been discussed uh, this week. So here we're seeing plasma sheet, plasma uh, closer to the planet, as well as the ring current region and the auroral oval associated with particle precipitation. Those charged particles raining down onto the neutral atmosphere, exciting neutral molecules who, when they relax back to their ground states, radiate photons at characteristic wavelengths. All right. So that's the kind of things we want to characterize and describe. And what we're going to do now is quickly go right back to basics. But you'll have heard a lot of this before. So hopefully we won't need to spend much time. And we're going to build up a picture of a plasma um, as a classical fluid by starting with a particle description. OK, so motion of charged particles influenced by electric and magnetic fields. So you guys know that the key force which acts on charged particles in a plasma arises from the electric and magnetic fields that that particle is subject to. And that's the Lorentz force, which we can write as a sum of the electric force and magnetic force that's um, felt by the particle. And the, uh, the most obvious kind of motion, um, something's gone wrong with my typing there, uh, but the most obvious kind of motion that results from the particle feeling this force is a simple gyration of the particle about the direction of the magnetic field, as shown in the cartoon here, with electrons gyrating in a, in a right-handed sense and ions in a left-handed sense. So um, the radius of gyration depends on the particle's momentum and the perpendicular component of velocity, perpendicular to the field direction, and of course the field strength. So you'll tend to get tighter circles of gyration at higher field strength. The kinetic energy of a gyrating particle doesn't change since this force alone, if we ignore electric field, is always perpendicular to the velocity direction. OK, so now what happens? We can think about what happens if we add a uniform electric field to the picture. And a particularly simple configuration to consider is where we have electric and magnetic fields at right angles to each other. And if you do this, something quite interesting happens. The particle essentially feels different force during the course of a single gyration. And you can convince yourself that for half of its gyratory orbit, the electric field will be accelerating the particle. So the motion of the particle will be in the sense of the E field. And for the other half, it will be decelerated by the E field. So the net effect of this is that the radius of curvature of the particle trajectory doesn't remain fixed. It changes with time. Okay? So the particle doesn't stay gyrating as a circle with a fixed center. It follows a trajectory whose instantaneous radius of curvature changes with time. And we can sort of think of this as the combination of two things. The first being a classical gyratory motion, and the second taking the center of that gyration and making that center drift with time. Okay? So essentially, this is known as the drift of the guiding center of the particle for this E and B field situation. And you can convince yourself, if you uh, do the calculation yourself, or if you look in a textbook, that the drift of that guiding center, the velocity with which it moves, is related to the cross product of the two fields. And its magnitude is the magnitude of the E divided by the magnitude of the B field. So that tells us that it doesn't matter if our particle is a proton or an electron. Its guiding center will drift with the same velocity in this configuration. So this kind of drift will not generate a net current in the plasma. Okay, It will get particles. Yes. Uh, 
Yeah, the 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 que Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, thank you, friend. That's a that's a good question. And and the question you're asking is a very fundamental one um, depending on how you want to approach the problem. Now, really what you should be doing is thinking about what are the forces on my plasma? It's going to respond to those forces and it's going to move in a certain way. But when plasma uh, uh, moves in a certain way with a certain bulk velocity, so the, if, the av if we know the average velocity of our plasma population, uh, then an electric field must arise in the plasma such that <coughs> the perpendicular component of that bulk velocity is equal to this quantity here. So at a microscopic level, Newton's law tells us how the plasma moves, but at a, macrosco uh, at a macroscopic level, Newton's law tells us how the plasma moves, but at a microscopic level, we always need self-consistent electric field to arise to be consistent with that plasma flow. So you can think of it as um, the, you, know, you get just enough charge separation in the plasma so that an electric field uh, of this magnitude arises corresponding to the perpendicular velocity with which the plasma is flowing. So it's the convective electric field of a moving plasma. Yep. You have zero electricity. Correct. But if you move into some other plane, for some reason, whatever reason that might be, right. um, then, you then get uh, uh, electric field that is very yep. relative to what the plane Right. But if some part of or some of the spontaneous field is the equalization of whatever, yep. you'll then begin to see in its brain the electric field that is accelerated into the brain which is the weak one. Yeah, essentially if you have, if you have um, a particle being added to a large body of plasma, if it's being picked up, that particle will, su will suddenly see the magnetic field and the E field corresponding approximately to the motion of the bulk of the particles. So it will, it, that particle itself will then start to drift with this guiding center speed. Okay. So, um, of course, there are other types of drift, and a good kind of guiding principle to keep in mind is that if your particle, whether it be an ion or an electron, sees a significant change in electric or magnetic field during a gyration period, then that change is going to lead to some kind of drift. So here I've listed um, a couple of different kinds of drift motion. Again, these are motions that you've heard about this week. The first is a so-called gradient drift. The thing that's changing with position here is the magnetic field. So this could be, for example, a dipole magnetic field of a planet or of the Earth. And what happens is that the particle sees different field strength during its gyration. And again, that leads to a difference in the radius of curvature of its trajectory and a drift of the guiding center with this quantity here, UG. And it depends on the kinetic energy of gyration, which I've written here as W perp, and the field strength B, and of course the gradient in field strength, the spatial gradient. Okay? So another kind of drift, which is kind of related to this one, is related to a particle which is moving back and forth along a magnetic field line. And this is a cartoon of a field line here showing us the radius of curvature of the field line with respect to C, some instantaneous center of curvature uh, of the path that the guiding center of the particle is taking. So a part of, if we sort of follow that particle in its guiding center frame, where the guiding center is stationary, then that particle will be subjected to a centrifugal force pointing uh, along this vector RC, away from the center of curvature of the path out through the particle position. And so because we have a force on the particle um, and we have a magnetic field, just as we have an E cross phi, E cross B guiding center drift, if you have any force exerted on the particle with a component perpendicular to B, you also get a corresponding guiding center drift. This depends, um, understandably, on the kinetic energy of the particle's motion parallel to the field the radius of curvature of the field line, and again on the field strength. Okay, so if we now take our formulae for the 
gradient and curvature drifts, and we think about the Earth's dipole field, and there's a diagram of that on the upper right here, and we consider a particle which is in the magnetic equatorial plane, where the field of the planet points from south to, <laughs> south to north, we can ask ourselves the question of how these kind of drift velocities contribute to the so-called ring current at the Earth, and in particular, why it should be that those drift motions um, contribute to a westward directed ring current. So my question for you guys is if we look at, let's say, the gradient drift to start off with, why is it that this formula will give us a westward directed ring current? So we know that the direction of B is pointing north, so that's fine. So what, what direction does grad B point in in this dipole field when we're at the equatorial plane? Towards the planet. Yep, OK. So we can paste that in. So here's grad B pointing towards the planet. And you can convince yourself that B cross grad B is westward. OK. So ions will drift westward, electrons eastward. But that's, that's OK, because an eastward drifting negative particle contributes to a westward current. And you can also convince yourself that the curvature vector of the field line in the equatorial plane points radially outwards. And again, curvature drift gives you a westward uh, drifting ion. So that's good, because it tells us that the drift motions associated with field change, spatial change in field, contribute to our ring current. Um, but I was wondering if any of you folks know of any other types of current which might contribute to the ring current in a plasma, apart from, apart from drift motions? No? You might have come across in your studies of um, E and M a uh, thing, thing called magnetization current. No? The idea with magnetization current is that uh, drift mo these drift motions here um, describe the motion of the guiding center of the particle. But remember that the other component of motion is the gyration that's superposed on that guiding center drift. Now, it turns out that in a plasma, if you have a very strong gradient in plasma density or plasma pressure, the net effect of all those billions and billions of little gyratory motions um, gives you an additional source of current. Okay. So you, you might have come across that in your studies. It's known as magnetization current. Um, there's a thing called diamagnetic current that's a related thing that you'll come across in textbooks as well. That's absolutely. Yeah, that's a, that's a that's a good point. So so the point that Fran is making is that divergence of current systems quite often give us field aligned currents that connect different regions in a magnetosphere. Yeah. The relative size of the magnetization current, I can't give you a definitive answer. It will depend on how strong is the gradient in the magnetic moment per unit volume of the plasma. I, I don't have that number in my head, but you can work it out. OK, so, um, okay, so there's our drift uh, and the associated currents. Now, another important aspect of this particle motion picture is that we can make life easy for ourselves if we come up with quantities which remain constant during the motion of these particles. And these are known as invariants. They don't vary with time during the motion of the particle. So a guiding principle here is that it's valid to use these invariants, uh, in particular the first adiabatic invariant associated with particle gyration, if the change in field 
which we need to, to, to drive a drift, if that change in field is small compared to the field itself over a single gyration, then it's valid to use this notion of, a, of an invariant quantity. Uh, and quantitatively, for gyratory motion, that invariant is equivalent to the magnetic moment of a gyrating particle. And there's a problem about this in the homework, which I hope will illustrate this further. But essentially, that quantity mu is the kinetic energy of gyration, W perp, divided by the field strength, B. Now, it turns out that if you have a particle executing gyrations in a dipole field, let's say, and, have, and its guiding center has a component of motion parallel to the field, then there's an effective force on the position of that guiding center, which is associated with this constant of the motion, and also associated with the gradient of the field strength along the length of the field line. So that force, there's a negative sign, and that tells us that the force acts to slow down the uh, motion of the guiding center as one approaches regions of higher field strength. And so uh, when the particle moves to higher B, its parallel component of velocity through this effect is decreasing. But because its V remains constant, if it's just subject to a V cross B force, we require the perpendicular component of the velocity to increase at the same time. So as you go to the region of higher field strength, essentially what you're doing is converting parallel to perpendicular motion. At some point, if the field becomes high enough, all of the motion will become perpendicular. And that's when you've reached your mirror point where the particle will, will reverse direction in the, in, the, in, in the, will reverse its motion in the direction parallel to the field. So here's a little cartoon that separates the total velocity um, into a component parallel to, and in particular perpendicular to the field here, with an angle alpha between the two known as the pitch angle. So you can show that the invariant mu here is proportional to the sine squared of alpha over b. So if this quantity here is constant all the way along a field line, then we can set that equal to its value at the mirror point. At the mirror point, alpha is equal to 90 degrees. Therefore, sine alpha is 1. And so at the mirror point, this is just 1 divided by the field strength. And if I set BM to be the field strength at the mirror point, you can convince yourself that that's equal to this quantity, B over sine squared alpha, anywhere along the field line that you choose to be. OK, so in the situation now where this value, B mirror, is stronger even than the surface field of the planet at the foot of your field line that you're traveling on, that tells you that that particle is going to get all the way down to the planet's atmosphere before it has a chance to mirror and reverse direction. And so what probably is going to happen with that particle is that it's going to collide with neutral species in the atmosphere and excite auroral emissions. But importantly, we can quantify what's called a loss cone at any position along the field line if the direction alpha of our particles satisfies this inequality here then that cone of particles, if you will, traveling in that cone of directions, are going to be lost to us and enter the atmosphere. OK, so to summarize um, some of these ideas, which, again, other lecturers have been talking about this week, we can assign uh, different invariants or constants of the motion to different categories of particle motion. OK, so a, a guiding principle here is that uh, each invariant is linked to a certain type of motion. So we have a first invariant for gyration. We have a second one for the bounce motion of a particle moving back and forth between its mirror points along a field line. And we have a third invariant associated with the azimuthal drift all the way around our favorite magnetized planet. And it's valid to think of those quantities as being true invariants or true constants of the motion provided that any changes of the field being experienced by the system um, are not occurring on time scales um, shorter, appreciably shorter than the time scale of the corresponding motion. If that does happen, you, you violate the principle of adiabaticity for that particular invariant. 
And of course, the combination of these three types of motion gives, us, gives rise to this famous concept of drift shells of particles um, being attached to particular uh, groups of field lines that intersect the magnetic equator at, at a common distance. OK, so another important aspect uh, of plasmas is how they behave on different scales. And a fundamentally um, important concept for a plasma is a thing known as a collective behavior, where a large group of particles, if you will, um, act together in response to changes that you try to impose on the plasma. So to illustrate this, we can think of throwing a test particle into a plasma that's in an equilibrium state. And so uh, what happens is that when you do this, if we, if we have, a, have a source ion which is positively charged, the electrons in the plasma, which are lighter and more mobile, will sort of move very quickly and be attracted towards that source. And in particular, that means that they will shield its influence from other particles that are more distant in the plasma. So the test ion doesn't feel the full electric field of this source ion because of this shielding effect. And we can calculate the characteristic length scale that, that this sheath of electrons um, uh, will acquire, the, the length scale of the density of that sheath or shield of electrons. And it turns out that that's known as the Debye length lambda d. So the electric potential falls off exponentially with the scale length lambda d from the source ion. And effectively, it's shut off for radial distances, which are very large compared to lambda d. Lambda d itself depends on the temperature of the shielding particles and their density. So colder, denser electrons are better shielders because they form a structure with a shorter length scale. Hence, it will cut off at shorter radial distances. So in this picture, overall, the plasma is quasi-neutral. What do we mean by quasi-neutral? We mean that if we take a box of plasma whose dimension, whose spatial dimension is very large compared to a Debye length, it will have approximately or pretty much equal numbers of ions and electrons. On a smaller scale, you can get separation of charge. So uh, an important sort of quantity to keep in mind here is how many shielding particles you can fit into a sphere, let's say, of radius lambda d, the Debye length scale on which this response happens. So provided you have enough particles to perform an effective shielding, then this collective behavior on scales large compared to lambda d will happen, and you will have a classical plasma. So this uh, plasma lambda parameter then is a measure of how many particles are in a Debye sphere. And as long as that's huge compared to unity, then you have collective behavior of the plasma and an effective shielding. Otherwise, you just have isolated moving particles um, which don't, and, and you don't have collective behavior like this on, on large scales. So to illustrate that, you can calculate uh, plasma lambda parameter for many different sources of plasma in the universe. So here's a table showing us some of these. Um, and this is taken from uh, Margaret Kivelson's chapter in the Intro to Space Physics textbook. Um, so here's your source of plasma in the universe, density, temperature, Debye length, and plasma lambda parameter. You'll notice that these quantities for all of them cover you know, a wide range of magnitude scales, but the common thing is that plasma lambda is always huge compared to one. So this collective behavior will arise in all cases. Okay. So if we compare, for example, the magnetosphere with the ionosphere, the ionospheric plasma, of course, is a lot denser. Temperature is a lot colder than your typical magnetospheric particle. Therefore, Debye length is a lot shorter. But despite that, the density sort of helps us win out and give us a plasma lambda parameter that is sufficiently large for collective behavior to, to apply. OK, so now we move towards MHD from this particle picture. And as I said, you know, it's, it's pointless for us with pencil and paper to try and, and monitor the, the motion of every, every single particle in our plasma. So MHD comes to our rescue and describes the plasma as a classical fluid in terms of its average quantities. And here are three 
um, equations uh, that I've picked out, which are particularly important in MHD because they link the electric and magnetic fields, uh, and they also link the currents and those fields as well. And one is Faraday's law, which relates spatial gradient of electric field to time-dependent changes in the magnetic field. Ampere's law, which you've heard about, that relates the current density J, which acts as a source of magnetic field B. And Ohm's law, which relates that current density to these electric and magnetic fields through this conductivity parameter sigma. And for a lot of space plasmas, which are effectively collisionless, you can think of sigma as approaching infinity. And then you can convince yourself that you retrieve the classical relationship of E being minus U cross B. U here is the bulk flow velocity of the plasma. Yes. So, is there ever a situation where you would want to take into consideration that you for For relativistic plasmas. You can, you can take Ampere's full law and you can cast it in a dimensional form and you can convince yourself that if your plasma is relativistic, that displacement term becomes important. That's, that's at least one example. Okay, so now if you kind of read a textbook or do the exercise yourself of combining all of those equations, you come up with a very useful equation that describes the time rate of change of the magnetic field at a fixed point in space. Um, and that's known as the induction equation. And it's got two terms. This one here, which you can see is a diffusive type term. And this one here, which is known as the convective term and depends on the flow pattern of the plasma represented by the bulk velocity u. So if our plasma is a idealized collisionless plasma and sigma approaches infinity, then this term here will be very small compared to that one. Okay? Now, if that convective term does indeed dominate, one can show that a thing called the frozen-in condition applies. Um, and that frozen-in condition basically tells us that if we follow the motion of a blob or a patch of plasma as it's moving, um, the magnetic flux threading that surface will remain constant. Okay? So in my cartoon here, my blob or patch of plasma is being, let's say, squeezed together, going from a larger surface S1 to a smaller surface S2. If you think of field lines as wires or elastic bands which are frozen into the plasma motion. You push field lines closer together, hence you increase field strength such that this total flux uh, integral through your surface remains constant. Okay, and that's a very um, useful concept to keep in mind when you're thinking of how plasma is moving through your system and affecting um, the consequent magnetic field strength and structure. Okay. Now, if we look at the force on the plasma due to the so-called um, magnetic force, which is the cross product of current density and magnetic field, we can do some algebra making use of Ampere's law and separate that force term, it's a force per unit volume, into these two quantities here. The first is a gradient of what's effectively known as a magnetic pressure. So that's a pressure that scales as the square of the magnetic field strength. So that's very useful because it tells us that we can treat you know, classical plasmas in MHD. We can treat their dynamics as though they are responding to an additional source of pressure associated with the magnetic field. But it's important to keep in mind that really the source of this force is the current that's flowing in the system. Magnetic pressure is just a, is a useful concept to characterize that. Okay? The other term here is the so-called magnetic tension force. Now, if you have something like a dipole field in a vacuum, you can do this calculation without any problem. But in that case, physically, in a vacuum, there's no current flowing. So mathematically, that tells you that in a vacuum, the sum of these two terms must always be 0. If you're not in a vacuum and there is a non-zero J, you still know that the component of this force parallel to the field is zero, right? Because J cross B is perpendicular to B, not parallel. And that tells you then that in the general case, the parallel component 
of these two uh, false terms must cancel. Okay, so the, per so the parallel uh, component of the magnetic pressure gradient must balance the parallel component of the tension force. In other words, what I'm trying to say, it's really the, the perpendicular component of these terms is, is really what matters in essence. Now, it turns out that if you calculate the perpendicular component of the tension force, you retrieve another very convenient expression, which is known um, by some people as the magnetic curvature force. And it scales again as the square of field strength, but importantly, it depends on the radius of curvature of the field at that point in space. So I always think of the curvature force. Um, I always picture the magnetic field line as being a, an elastic band. And if you stretch it out and it adopts a very small radius of curvature, then the curvature force is going to want to straighten that field line back out and give you a larger RC. The classical place at a magnetosphere where this might happen is near the X line of a reconnection process where you get these very long stretched out flux tubes with small RC, hence large curvature force. Uh, curvature force is also very important in the rapidly rotating um, outer magnetospheres of Jupiter and Saturn, which have disk-like structures. And in particular, centrifugal force in those plasma disks is very strong. And it turns out that the curvature force inward, associated with the stretched magnetic field, balances the strong centrifugal force plus pl uh, plasma pressure gradient outward. And we'll come back to the, uh, the giant planet situation a little later. OK, so now what you can also do with the induction e equation is cast it into a very simple what's known as dimensional form, where you replace all the derivatives by uh, quotients of the field with a characteristic time scale or length scale. And that's something that physicists quite often do to compare different terms in an equation and think about those, ter uh, those mathematical terms um, in the context of the length scale and time scale of the dynamical system that they're studying. So if you do that, you get something like this for the induction equation. And so in this uh, formalism here, the ratio of the convective to diffusive terms scales as this quantity here. It's known as the magnetic Reynolds number, and it's high for a collisionless fast-flowing plasma. If you have a, a regime where this quantity approaches, let's say, 1, then the diffusive term in the induction equation becomes important. And field lines, if you think of those as dynamical quantities, they can, they can slip with respect to the plasma flow. The frozen-in condition will no longer apply. Somewhere this can happen is near the X line associated with reconnection. This is a diagram that Mark also showed in his lecture, showing you the converging flows, which contain oppositely directed field, or almost oppositely directed field, showing you also the current sheet that must support the outflowing plasma, which adopts a very uh, distorted field shape with a very high radius of curvature, high curvature force driving those strong outward flows post the reconnection process. Fran. Uh-huh. Dynamo simulations. Dynamo. Right. 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 I mean, in those situations, it's really, really dense environment. Right. 
And I think, thank you, that's a very good point, Fran. And, and, and another important point about the Reynolds number is that you can have a finite conductivity, but if you have a, if you have a system where the field exists on adequately large length scale, then the frozen in condition will still be OK. And, that's, and, I, and I suppose that's one reason why maybe laboratory plasma physicists might look at space plasma physicists and say, hey, you're studying systems where this length scale is much larger than we can ever hope to achieve in labs here on Earth. Hence, even with a finite conductivity, your frozen in condition will still apply. And you can use that idea to describe the dynamics of the plasma. Carl. OK. 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 OK, so we can think of it as the uh, ratio of a microscopic to a macroscopic diffusion coefficient. OK. OK, so uh, now we come back to our picture of the magnetosphere. And here we're comparing basic parameters, physical parameters associated with different plasma regimes. Um, here's a diagram here, similar to what I showed before. So let me ask you guys what you think these white arrows represent. We've got white arrows kind of pointing around this way at the top. We've got a white arrow here pointing planetward, planetward here. Sorry, I've got a whole bunch of stuff at once there. The motion. It's essentially flow, uh, you know, flow velocity of the plasma. And we have two points labeled X on the day side and the night side here. So here, what's occurring? Reconnection, right? It's just X line associated with reconnection. So when we have reconnection occurring at the night side, for example, it sets up, it drives characteristic flows. And we also have different plasma regimes associated with those flow structures. We have a plasma sheet boundary layer, for example, here, closest to the tail X line. Now, it turns out that in that plasma, you've got extremely fast streams of particles following the field. Um, and if they mirror near the planet, then you'll have two so-called beams uh, of particles going back and forth. And that's the sort of dominant kind of flow for that regime. So here, thermal energy, or the random motion of the particles, is small compared to the kinetic energy of these organized beams that are flowing. Um, as we come closer to the planet, we come into the plasma sheet, which is a much hotter population, KeV energies or so. And here, flow energy or organized flow energy, bulk flow, is small compared to the thermal energy. So here, random motions are, are, are dominating more and more. Um, OK, and we get more plasma sheet particles, as you heard in previous lectures, from ionospheric species, such as O+, relative to solar wind species, such as H+, at active times, okay, when reconnection is strong and the system is being very strongly driven. OK. So you can compare uh, these quantities, density, temperature, field strength, plasma beta, for your different regimes. If we compare, for example, uh, magnetosheath with tail lobe, magnetosheath is very uh, dense compared to the very tenuous lobes of the tail outside the plasma sheet. And the, uh, the field strengths are similar, but the, the field strength in the lobe is, is somewhat larger. And the plasma beta in the lobe, since it's such a low density regime, is, is much smaller than in the sheath. OK, so we've heard a lot about reconnection at the Earth, but what about reconnection at other planets? All right. The lesson that I want to, I hope, illustrate here is that we've seen pictures of reconnecting regions, and we've thought about reconnection this week in terms of something that depends on a high magnetic shear. Okay? So if you have field lines coming together, which are oppositely directed, you expect reconnection to take place. But then we can ask the question, well, you know, do they have to be exactly anti-parallel? Can there be a finite angle between them? How large can that angle be? 
uh, before reconnection effectively shuts down. So some studies that have been done at other planets um, help us inform our idea about this. And in particular, it turns out that not only is magnetic shear an important quantity that determines reconnection uh, rate, if you will, but plasma beta is also a very important quantity. And in particular, the change in plasma beta across your reconnecting region. Okay? So if we focus in on a recent study done by Adam Masters and co. at Saturn, um, Saturn, we think, um, in terms of day-side reconnection, is not very strongly driven. We don't see, to my knowledge, we haven't seen any evidence of magnetic flux transfer events at Saturn, although we have seen some evidence of, of reconnection. So what Masters et al. did is they studied magnetopause crossings at Cassini measured by the Cassini spacecraft, and they measured the magnetic shear going from the magnetosheath into the magnetosphere and the angle between the two fields. And they also had information about how plasma beta was changing across uh, this magnetopause boundary. And the reason that they looked at this change in plasma beta is because work that has been done by Swizdak et al., for example, shows us that if we have a high enough change in plasma beta, uh, what that means is the usual situation when you have a high enough beta. Um, you folks have learned in lectures this week that if we have a low beta regime, then it's the magnetic field that's in charge and kind of tells the plasma how to flow. It gives the plasma a magnetic framework that kind of supports its flow. But if beta is much higher, then it's the sort of thermal energy of the plasma that's in charge. And in fact, it's so strong that it can even distort the field structure appreciably. So that, in essence, is what happens when you have high enough plasma beta at the site of reconnection. The nice classical X line that you want to form to support reconnection, that magnetic structure becomes strongly distorted by high plasma beta through a process known as diamagnetic drift. You can read the details in this paper. What that means for Saturn is that reconnection is very often strongly suppressed. So if we look at the diagram from Masters et al., we have magnetic shear here going from 0 to 180, and change in beta on a logarithmic scale here going from 0.01 to 1,000. OK, so the data points here correspond to magnetic uh, magnetopause crossings observed by Cassini. The solid curve here gives us the theoretical curve of separation between where reconnection is suppressed and where it is possible. And you'll see that where reconnection is possible, you need either an unusually low delta beta or an unusually high magnetic shear. Okay? Mercury has been studied by de Braccio et al. in a similar context. And here, it's the opposite end of the story. At Mercury, beta is relatively low. And so you can have a relatively high magnetic shear angle, and you'll still drive reconnection quite happily. Okay, So this is messenger data that they studied. And again, you've got shear, the vertical axis here, uh, beta in the magnetosheath, this time along the horizontal axis. And again, the theoretical curve uh, separating where reconnection is possible from where it's suppressed. And you can see that um, there's a lot of messenger crossings here where you can uh, attain reconnection, where there's evidence of reconnection happening at you know, magnetic shears even as, as large as you know, 100 or so degrees. Okay? So these planets represent different extremes of reconnection. Um, and I think they illustrate quite nicely that we not only need to consider magnetic shear in the problem, but also an intrinsic property of the plasma itself, in particular the change in, in plasma beta across the boundary. Absolutely. And that's, yes, that's, that's why if we want to favor reconnection at Saturn, one way in which we can do it is if we get adequately um, anti-parallel fields. Or, or, or is what you're saying uh, the other way? Ah. Okay. Uh, 
Okay. Okay, so just before we go to the break, I'll show you one more slide. Um, and we're going to sort of now start to consider uh, different planetary magnetospheres. And to set the scene, here's a reminder of the um, magnetospheric field configuration and the associated currents. Uh, so again, that same cartoon of the Earth's magnetosphere or diagram of the Earth's magnetosphere that I was showing. Um, and just sort of a couple of points here that if we have external field structures which depart very strongly from the planet's internal dipole, let's say, those are usually supported by distributions or sheets of current, such as, let's say, the, the current sheet in the tail, which I've illustrated here with its uh, perturbation field. So these currents generate um, a field of their own which modify the background dipole in different ways. So the tail current sheet acts to extend dipole field lines into a tail-like geometry, and the ring current does a sim uh, can do a similar thing. And the, uh, the compression of the day side field um, is associated with the magnetopause current. So the magnetopause current at the Earth uh, flows eastward across the face or the nose of the magnetopause, and that acts to uh, intensify the magnetospheric field just inside um, the magnetopause boundary. Okay? So after the break, um, we'll come back and we'll look in more detail at this picture of uh, pressure balance at the nose of the magnetopause, and that will lead us then on into uh, a discussion of magnetospheric compressibility. Let's go.